Good morning. Good morning. A reading from the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 16, verses 13 through 24. Be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. Do everything in love. You know that the household of Stephanus were the first converts in Achaia, and they have devoted themselves to the service of the Lord's people. I urge you, brothers and sisters, to submit to such people and to everyone who joins in the work and labors at it. I was glad when Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaicus arrived because they supplied what was lacking from you, for they refreshed my spirit and yours also. Such men deserve recognition. The churches in the province of Asia send you greetings. Aquila and Priscilla greet you warmly in the Lord, and so does the church that meets at their house. All the brothers and sisters here send you greetings. Greet one another with a holy kiss. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. If anyone does not love the Lord, let that person be cursed. Come, Lord. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. My love to all of you in Christ Jesus. Amen. Good morning, Grace. Good morning. Good morning. I know I sent out an email earlier uh, this week and uh, had a number of people say, so it's your last Sunday, right? No, it's not. <clears throat> but uh, my name is Armin, and I'm really glad that you're here with us today. Uh, I want to show you a little picture. We're ending our series in 1 Corinthians. We've been in and out of 1 Corinthians for the last couple of years, and, and now we're at, in the very last passage. And uh, so a picture I want to share with you is a, a picture of me, my, uh, my sister, and my wife, and then my sister's daughter, my niece. And uh, my sister's the one in the teal right next to me. And her name is Jennifer. She lives in Iowa. She, she loves the Lord deeply. She's the one who really sparked in me an interest in the Lord, who gave me a Bible when I graduated from high school uh, that said... Uh, to Armin, either this book will keep you from sin or sin will keep you from this book, which really freaked me out <laughs> as, as a, a brand new budding graduate, high school graduate. But <clears throat> so she is a woman of great faith. She has a very strong and powerful testimony. Uh, she's been through a lot. Uh, Jennifer endured the death of her 12 year old daughter due to leukemia. Uh, she and her husband experienced a financial reversal uh, a couple of decades ago that left them basically uh, penniless and they had to start all over again. Then they adopted three children uh, after the death of their young daughter and they were all, those three were siblings. And then because they were doing such a great job with them, several years later the state contacted them and asked them if they would adopt another four siblings. I told her she was nuts, but <clears throat> as I said, she's a woman of great faith, and, and they did that. All, all of those kids faced challenges, uh, some of them born in prison, uh, some, several of them victims of child porn abuse, uh, just all kinds of difficulties, and they poured their lives into kids with some difficult problems. Uh, then her husband's diagnosis with cancer and then her son's diagnosis, her adoptive son's diagnosis with leukemia, uh, the first time from which he recovered, and then her own diagnosis with cancer, and then her son's diagnosis a second time with leukemia, again recovered after a bone marrow transplant. And my sister has really been through it, but through it all, I have never ever heard my sister complain about how God has treated her, but rather he, she talks about the goodness and the greatness and the faithfulness of God. If I had to choose 
one word that would describe my sister, it's the word resilient. You know what resilience is? Uh, resilience is the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties and, and toughness. It means to, to be able to bounce back, to spring back from adversity, from all kinds of bad news, even, even from tragedy. But the funny thing about resilience is that even though it is a, it's a valuable trait, it's not something that you're born with. It's not automatic in your life. Uh, you, you aren't gifted with resilience. It's more like a muscle that everybody has, but that you won't really experience the benefits from that muscle unless you build it very intentionally and strengthen it over time. Now, Paul addresses the church in Corinth in an era when they would need to develop resilience. And if you and I are, if we're entering a time, we're in a time where you and I as followers of Jesus Christ are called to develop spiritual resilience. In fact, if I, if I had to take all of these messages, in particular this message and, and Paul's closing statement, especially in verse 13, it's that you're going to need to cultivate spiritual resilience in these times. Because setbacks, perhaps even persecution, are inevitable. And there are a number of core components and what we might even call building blocks for spiritual resilience that we can address in, the, in this passage. And if I were to summarize all four together, it, it would be uh, the building block of alertness, determination, courage, and intentional life in community uh, connected with other believers. And of course, all of these uh, refer to people, when, I, when we talk about these, it's in the context of having a real relationship with Jesus Christ, people who have put their trust in him. So l let me go through each one of these briefly. Uh, let's talk first of all about alertness, really spiritual alertness. In 1 Corinthians 16, 13, he says, be on your guard. Now, the word that he uses in the New Testament there means literally you stay awake, uh, be watchful, be vigilant, don't let yourself drift off, don't be distracted. It, it's the imagery of somebody who maintains a, a sharp and alert mind for opportunities, for danger. It's the opposite of what I would call cruise control living. It was interesting when I, I talked about this and I just, we talked about using this illustration of cruise control with our teaching team and I said, yes, yeah, so, you know, a recent innovation, and they said, no, no, you're really dating yourself on this. Cruise control has been around for like all of our lives. <laughs> Maybe it was invented during your lifetime. <laughs> Not really. But you know what cruise control is, you know. You're, you're able to set a, a constant speed and you don't have to look, you know, continually at the speedometer. Very useful uh, when we were living in Colorado and driving back and forth between the, new, between the Northeast, and we drive through Nebraska, where Interstate 80 is like just straight arrow. Uh, you know, you feel like you, if, you could, if you had a Tesla, you know, where you just put the destination in, it would just follow along, or maybe you could bungee cord your steering wheel and just set, set the cruise control and you go straight, not having to turn. But the problem with cruise control is that it, it develops complacency. You know what I'm talking about? You know, you don't, you don't pay attention as much. You kind of zone out a little bit. You become less alert. And there's a tendency to do this in our spiritual lives. Many of us operate our, our spiritual lives on cruise control. Uh, we may, you know, we set our speed on Sunday morning or maybe a, a, at a particular time you've watched a podcast or you've experienced a teaching online. And, and by the way, I'm really glad that uh, we have folks that are joining us online today. Maybe you're worshiping with us that way, and, and I'm, I'm grateful for that. But we, you know, we set our speed, and then we drone down the rest of the week, or maybe even the rest of the month, on cruise control, spiritually speaking. And our reaction time to spiritual opportunities and also to danger is slow. 
And Paul warns about this in 1 Thessalonians 5, 6. He says, so then let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. I have a number of questions that I, that I have written in my journal, uh, at the back of my journal, which I regularly review. And uh, I won't go through all the questions, but I, I summarize it all with a, with a prayer that I regularly bring before the Lord and, and it's, Lord, keep me alert today to opportunities, dangers, truths, and lies. That's a good prayer. Would you agree? Yeah. So ask the Lord daily. Start your day. Just say, Lord, keep me alert today to oppor- opportunities, dangers, truths, and lies. If you're going to cultivate Resilience, spiritual resilience in your life, it's going to require alertness. Don't, don't live your spiritual life on cruise control. Be, be spiritually alert. And then the, the second core component or building block, you might say, is uh, determination, spiritual determination. Uh, again, and I'm, I'm focusing most of my attention, of course, on verse 13 in this passage. Uh, He says, stand firm in the faith. And when he talks about the faith, he's not just saying have faith. When he talks about the faith, he's specifically referring to the promises and the precepts and the principles that you find in the word of God. Uh, Like in 2 Thessalonians 2.15, where he writes, So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold fast to the teachings we passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. It's it's to know and to recite and to rehearse in your mind what the word teaches. That's what it means to stand firm in the faith. It means to, to know and then to base your convictions and your decisions and your approach to life on the word of God. And this is especially important as we train the next generation of believers. Uh, Our our vision statement is to raise up generations of families that are built to last. And that is still relevant, and it's especially relevant today, because the building, the key building component of society is the family. And with families falling apart, In this day and age, we need to make sure that we instill a foundation of truth in our kids' lives. Would you agree with that? So here are some suggestions. Set a family foundation. Establish a time each day. Maybe even if you live alone, you're you're a family of one, you might say. Or it's just you as a couple. Or maybe you have kids. Uh, read a portion of the Bible. You can use any one of a number of apps. You can use the U version, which we uh, endorse. Um, my daughter Rachel was talking to me this week. She's visiting from Colorado. She and her husband and son, and they use uh, an app called the the Bible Recap. And by the way, uh, you may not be able to uh, to find that or write all this stuff down. But if you use our app, you can go to the sermon, the service resources, and look at the sermon discussion guide. And, and all of my notes, all of our notes are basically on there. You find all this stuff on there. But uh, she uses that. It's a great thing. She uses that with her, with her son. Uh, train your family to, to separate truth from lies. You know, have a conversation, whether maybe it's with your spouse, maybe it's with your kids, maybe it's with your friends. Uh, can you identify something today that you suspect was a lie? Especially train your kids to become truth detectors. But in order to do that, we've got to talk about it. And, and the thing is, in this day and age in, in, in education, if you do not do that, your kids are going to swallow lies. So process their education with them. Then apply God's wisdom to life. Uh, one of the things that, that my wife and I do, uh, uh, I, I take, uh, I often read out of the book of Common Prayer, which has, uh, it's sort of, you know, anyway, uh, it's, it's, uh, it has the, the, all the Psalms in it. 
And I'll read a psalm to her every night, and we talk about it just very briefly. Uh, when we're done with it, we've been reading the psalms now for a couple of years, and just on and on, over and over and over again. And when we're done with it, with this cycle of it, we're going to start with Proverbs, one of the best things you can do. In fact, Scott McRae mentioned this in his message last week about reading a chapter from Proverbs uh, each day. And if, if you do that, then your family especially your kids, will be equipped with wisdom. So when you're facing decisions as a family, you ask yourself, you know, we've been reading in Proverbs, what do you think would be a wise decision in this situation? You stand firm in the faith, the principles, precepts, and promises of God's word, and you'll develop a spiritually resilient life. Make that a habit in your life. And then a, a third core component, really a building block, is spiritual cur courage. It's a, it's a boldness to stay the course despite opposition. It's, it's to follow unchanging truth instead of uh, the sentiments that shift with each passing decade in the culture in which we live. It's to, it's to very intentionally choose a life of integrity where your, your private life is the same as your public life. To, to remind yourself that loving kindness is is more important than meeting your own needs and preferences. Steadfastness, being guided by the, the unshifting north star of the lordship of Christ, regardless of what others think. It's, it's the choice that the apostles Peter and John made in Acts 4 when the religious authorities tried to silence them and said, look, you, we don't want you to teach any longer in the name of Jesus. Acts 4, 18 through 20 talks about that. But, but what did Peter and John say? You be the judges, but as for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. He said, well, you may have your opinion and what you feel, but we're going to do what we know is right. And we have entered an era which calls for courage, haven't we? without being intimidated by the crowd. Uh, forgive me for making this uh, about the family of Armin and Nancy, but uh, one of the proudest moments of my life was, was when my daughter stood up for her Christian convictions at Lenape Valley High School, uh, just around here. And, and it was years ago, I mean, she's 41 years old now, but uh, there was a handful of kids that would meet regularly around the flagpole, and it was an event called Prayer at the Pole. It was actually kind of a nationwide thing, but it wasn't followed by a whole lot of students in the Northeast. And they would gather around the flagpole before school in the morning. It wasn't every morning, but it was regular. And they would pray for their students, fellow students, for their teachers, for America, for their school. And school buses would come in, and, and this is New Jersey, you know, and so there would be kids who would be yelling at them and mocking at them and spitting at them as they drove by in the school bus. I asked my daughter about this yesterday. She said, yeah, I remember that. I remember it well. And it yielded great benefits because even though there were those difficulties relationally, do you think there maybe was a ton of respect on the part of those who saw people like that standing up? See, to be courageous means that you're willing to live against the grain of the culture. You cut against the grain. You familiar with who John Bunyan was? 17th century author of The Pilgrim's Progress, also a preacher. Uh, he went to jail for preaching the gospel. And he wrote this in his journal. He said, I will stay in prison till the moss grows on my eyelids rather than to disobey God. Imagine that. I mean, that's, that's courage. You, you want to cultivate spiritual resilience, then be alert. Don't, don't live life on cruise control. You, you be alert to the opportunities and dangers, to truths and lies. You, you base your life and your convictions and your, and your decisions on the principles and, and the promises and the precepts of God's word. You, and you, 
you make that part of the grain of what you are. You be courageous. You realize that, that if you, uh, what Jesus told his disciples, and, and we see it in the epistles as well, that everyone who wants to live a, a godly life will be persecuted. You will be. You'll be mocked. That's okay. Well, it's not okay. I don't like it, but, but you know what I mean. And then there's community. Boy. Paul says at the end of 1 Corinthians 16, 13, he says, be strong. Uh, by the way, his command uh, is actually more literally become strong. He's, he's referring to a process of exercise and strengthening. And one of the things that I've learned uh, about uh, doing any kind of exercise, and, and I'm, a, I'm a really disciplined person, but it's, it's really hard to maintain something as a solo exercise. Do you know what I'm talking about? You do. You know what I mean. Uh, it's just, it's better often to train as a team because you get reinforcement, you get, you get encouragement. Uh, and, to, and to maintain something alone for months and, and years is difficult. Uh, as I look around here, there are some of, some of us who've done very well at that, and some of us may could probably use some encouragement, all right? You know what I mean. Do you remember the classic exercise system that was called Nordic Track? I bought one of those back in the 90s. And I think I paid $350 for it. That was a lot of money back then. That was when $350 was worth at least $300, right? <laughs> and I, I actually was pretty consistent on it for a long time. But I would do it early in the morning, and, and there weren't a lot of, I wasn't getting a lot of positive feedback. Finally, I just stopped. And I eventually sold it at a yard sale for $30 to a neighbor. Maybe that was one of you, I don't know. Uh, now, there's some advantages to training solo. You can go at your own pace, but a disadvantage is that we get lazy, and there's nobody around who cares. Some people can pull it off, a few. But training with others has that, that built-in accountability and encouragement. That's why community is so important. That's one of the things, on one of the components of our Run for God ministry. Some of you are familiar with that. It's a, it's a ministry that really has been devoted over the years to, to take people who might otherwise be couch potatoes and to turn them into runners and people who are disciplined and fit. And it's not just about running. It's about the Word of God. It's about community. It's about encouragement. It's about accountability. And that's one of the reasons why the Run for God ministry has been so successful. It's because it's biblical. Proverbs 27, 17 talks about iron sharpening one another. So one person sharpens another. Uh, community sharpens and it strengthens us. That's why it's so important. It's not just about counting numbers. Uh, Ecclesiastes 4.12 is a, is a passage that you may know. The, the one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. And I love this last part. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. You and I need people in our lives who will call us to a higher level. The aim, as we read in Hebrews 10.24, is to spur one another on. But it requires us to gather. I had a conversation just yesterday with somebody uh, who I haven't seen in a long time uh, gathering for worship. And I, I uh, called him back and I said, I said, hey, you know, did a little encouragement, a little checkup. And I said, hey, you know what? I want to see your face again. I want to see you back. He goes, well, I'm, I'm, I'm getting a lot of what I need online. I mean, there's a lot of good stuff that you can get online. Uh, you, you can probably get much better teaching. You can get the best of the best of the best if you go online and you know who to listen to. You know what teaching. You know what, who is, who's reliable. And that's a wonderful thing. Hebrew, but Hebrews 10.25 says, don't give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. 
We are to spur one another on. So think about it this way. Listen carefully. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, and barring health concerns, you're content to be online, you're ignoring both an opportunity and a danger. So you're joining us online. I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled that you're joining us online. I really am. But you need to come together with the larger body of Christ. You need it, and it needs you. Because even if you get the best teaching, let's, let's say you know where to find the best teaching online, uh, you'll be able to get this high in your Christian life. But with even mediocre teaching, if you're gathering and you're spurring one another on and you're holding one another accountable, you'll achieve even higher. That's why it's so important. You need it. It needs you. The body of Christ needs you. I mean, when you look at verses 15 through 18, the, the, the passage that Nancy DiRienzo read for us before, that she talked about the household of Stephanus and and she talked about Fortunatus and Achaicus and these different people. And he talks about how in verse 18 that they were refreshed. They, re they refreshed his spirit. Why do you think that was? Paul was probably the guy who led them to the Lord. They were the first converts in the province of Asia. They were part of his community. He, he then mentions uh, Priscilla and Aquila who were a couple who ministered together with him as a team. It is the fellowship of believers that will make up for what is lacking in your life. That intentional commitment to community is so important. And so in verses 19 and 20, you know, as I mentioned, he talks about Aquila and Priscilla and, and he, about the church that, that uh, met in their house. They were good friends, co-workers. Uh, this was a church that met in their home. They were a community. Like I said before, listening or watching to good teaching really isn't enough. Even mediocre teaching in the context of community will make you excel higher. You need others to support you, to correct you, and to encourage you. And if you aren't part of a group, uh, then you want to probably join a small group. You can Find those resources on our app, Grace Church on the Mount app. But you especially need, like I said before, barring health concerns, you need, to, you need to be gathering. And that will enable you to cultivate spiritual resilience. You know what a marathon is, right? 26.2 mile run, I, which I've never done. Right? But that requires resilience. <clears throat> Marathoners talk about the challenge of getting past what they call the wall. That's the, the point in the race where your brain, sensing that your body is low on fuel, screams, stop! I contacted several of our Run for God participants and asked them about their experience running marathons. And these, these were people who had been couch potatoes, but became marathoners. Well, maybe they weren't couch potatoes, but they were, I don't know, something. <laughs> but one of them wrote back to me, he, and I loved what he wrote. He said, for us mortals, a marathon can take four to six hours, even longer. It's a huge drain, especially when your body is hitting its limits. They say that mile 20 is the halfway point in a 26.2 marathon. And my experience is that once you've gotten to mile 20, it's a matter of overcoming the mind. Running with God and with your community helps to align your will with his and to make it over the finish line. In my first marathon, a Marine Corps marathon, I had to walk much of the last three miles. Someone, but someone that was part of the large crowd, a stranger, came up to me as I was stumbling along and dazed. He put his arms around me and said, you can do this. You have only one mile to go. And this simple but brave gesture was just what I needed and gave me enough to finish as strong as I could. 
as in a physical marathon. Finishing well spiritually requires resilience. And the core components of the building blocks of spiritual resilience are it's spiritual alertness, it's determination, courage, and that strange, essential call to community. You pay attention to these, and you will develop a life of spiritual resilience. Father, my prayer, my brothers and my sisters, is that we will be that kind of people, that we will be a people observant and cognizant of these building blocks. And Father, that if there's anyone who, who's not yet in a relationship with you through Jesus, that today they take a step in that direction. And maybe this is the beginning of a journey for them that they trust Christ as their Savior, Christ alone. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me? And And now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church, and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. 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 If you need prayer, uh, there'll be our prayer uh, team up here. I'll see you next week. I love you.